Hello everyone and thank you for watching this video. Today we're going to talk about the evidence lower bound loss. This is a follow-up video for my previous video about the reparameterization trick. And in this video we'll talk about the loss function for the variational autoencoder model. More specifically, we'll talk about exactly what it is and why we use it. Um, we'll talk about the mathematical aspects of the elbow loss. Uh, and similar to my other videos, the, the definitions that revolve around uh, the loss function. And I guess at the end, we'll also talk about how the reparameterization trick fits into this uh, specific loss function. Okay, let's start with the what and why. So in the previous video, we talked about the encoder-decoder architecture. This model receives an input, say an image, into the encoder. The encoder then reduces the image to a lower dimensional space, usually denoted as Z. And then the decoder uh, reconstructs the same image. Now, the variational autoencoder, the one that uses the elbow loss function uh, for training, is slightly different. It receives an image as input, and then, well, it does uh, reconstruct another instance of, uh, say, a similar image, but that would be for inference. So I guess this would be a generalization of what the VAE actually is. But to be more specific, in the training process, the same image that would be uh, the input would also be the output for the reconstruction term. And also, as part of the training process, we would need to sample Z from a Gaussian distribution. This is where the reparameterization trick comes into play. And again, we'll see that more from the mathematical aspects at the end of this video. So as a user who wants to generate a new image, we don't really need the encoder. All we do is we, again, sample from this latent space, and then we simply plug that into the decoder and we get a new instance taken from the same distribution as the original data set. So overall, when we want to train our variational autoencoder, the problem is that, well, we need the decoder because we cannot simply generate uh, the images because they are high dimensional. And so our solution as part of the framework, as part of the architecture is to use this uh, lower dimensional space. And this lower dimensional space, Z has a structure which has some similarities to the original dataset distribution. This is part of the training process that we try to impose on the lower dimensional space structure. And in the next part of this video, we're going to elaborate on how this happens. Let's view this uh, from a mathematical perspective. Uh, given our data set D, for every sample X from that data set, we would want our generative model to be able to uh, maximize the probability that it would generate the observed data X. Another way to phrase this would be to maximize the evidence, which again is our data set. The evidence is also referred to as the marginal likelihood, and uh, we denote this as P of X. And for numerical stability, we also use log of P of X. For our latent variable Z, we have some assumptions. I mean, we still haven't explained the relationship between X and Z, but just Z alone, what we do want to have is a Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And regarding the structure of X related to Z, uh, we can uh, elaborate that using the sum of probability rule. So we can express the probability of X with all of the given samples of Z in a continuous place, uh, uh, space. But since this is an infinite number of uh, possibilities, then this is intractable. And this is where the original problem actually comes from. We cannot uh, simply sample, we cannot have a generative model that simply gives us the, uh, the images um, because this is a, there's no closed form solution for this. 
and I guess this is a first a good uh, place to start talking about uh, Elbow's first lost terms, which is the reconstruction term. What happens is that given x, we get some uh, sample z that corresponds to x. And then what we want to do is to maximize the probability or maybe the log probability that x would be reconstructed, reconstructed given z. And well, this part is referred to as the likelihood. And the second part with the, what we sample from the Latin space is the posterior distribution. And while this is tractable, we can compute this. We'll see in the next slide that this is intractable and actually it, it, it leads us back to this original problem. The intuition behind why this is tractable is that, well, if I would give you Z and I would ask you to train some decoder that would eventually uh, um, uh, reconstruct X, that would be possible because we have this data set X and I already give you Z as a condition. So this is, uh, this is possible. The reason why this is intractable, the second, second part, the posterior distribution, is because if we open the posterior distribution using base rule, then we get that the lower part of the fraction is P of X, which again was our original uh, problem. And the solution for this is to approximate uh, the posterior distribution. This is called variational inference. And what we do in variational inference is, like I said, we approximate this distribution, P, Z of X. And the, the, we, it's usually denoted not by P, but by Q. We'll see that in the next uh, slides. Uh, this is also referred to in the literature as variational uh, distribution. So to sum the first uh, term uh, of the elbow loss function, it's that well, uh, we want to maximize this expectation, but the posterior distribution is intractable. So all we do is we, we replace this P with a Q and we get the approximated uh, posterior distribution. So now that we can sample, of course, we would have to explain how we do this, but suppose we can sample from this uh, poster approximated posterior distribution, then we can sample Z from that distribution and using the decoder that we have trained in, while uh, training the variational autoencoder model, we can now get a new sample of the data set. Okay, let's talk about the second uh, last term. Now, there's something not that intuitive about the different terms of the elbow's loss function. I mean, uh, for, for other loss functions, it's take the first term, second term, and then sum everything together. And for elbow, it's, it's, it's kind of different because what you do is you get the first and second terms uh, from a derivation. And so it was still, I think it was important to explain the first term such that when we reach it in the following slides, it would be much easier to understand. So let's start to understand how we get to the second term. What we want to do is to minimize the distance, and I'll explain in just a second why it's like not a real distance between these distributions. First is the real posterior distribution. The other one is the approximated posterior distribution. After derivation, since the uh, posterior is intractable, then we would actually uh, relate it, uh, the, the, uh, the approximated posterior distribution to the distribution of, of Z, which we do know because we have some assumptions on. And the distance is what's called the kolbeck lieber divergence. And I would have to make a whole other video about this, uh, about this concept. Uh, for us, uh, again, we use it to quantify uh, the so-called distance between uh, these two different uh, distributions. Uh, the reason it's not a real distance metric is because it doesn't uh, follow some uh, basic qualities that distance should have. Like, it's not symmetric. Without going too much into the details, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same value if we switch the two different distributions. So, uh, and again, in this video, we'll treat it as a black box. And we have to know two things about this. One is that it does have some closed form solution that we will use in the next slide as part of our derivation. 
And the second is a property that KL divergence is always non-negative, meaning at the very least, it could be equal to zero. This is when the two distribution are exactly the same. And the larger it gets, the more the two different distributions are uh, different one from another. So let's start the derivation. And at the end, what we would expect is that we get the elbow loss function as part of the derivation for the KL divergence between these two different distributions. I just want to remind again that this part, the posterior distribution, is intractable. Okay. So uh, the, the definition for the KL divergence is the expected uh, value of the first uh, distribution, uh, the approximated posterior distribution, and the log between the two. First thing we do is uh, in the lower part of the fraction, we open this using base term, uh, base rule. And then uh, the, the second part, we will just, this is just a, a play with fractions. We will uh, move the P of X uh, up over to the upper part of the fraction. And well, it would be easier to continue in the next slide. Now we keep everything in the expected value. So still everything is inside the expected value. All we do is we apply some log rules. So instead of a fraction, we could have a minus between the two terms. And the upper term, what we do is we split it into a plus. We could also do the same for the, for the lower part, but at this stage we don't. And the reason we do this is because log of P has some uh, special property within uh, the expected value. So we already know that P of X is intractable because that was the beginning of our problem. But once it's inside the expected value, uh, X is already a given. So uh, inside uh, the expected value, we can treat it as a constant. And that means that we can actually move it out of the expected value uh, <coughs> term. So it would look like this. See, what we did here is we removed the log of P from within the expected value, uh, since again, it's a constant. And we also, inside the expected value, we switched the signs uh, of the two terms. And because we switched the, the, the signs, then there's a minus uh, before that. This is to make it easier in the following steps. So let's kind of break it down and see that KL divergence at this stage is equal to, again, log of P and, well, minus whatever is in, inside the expected value. And we can play around with the different uh, uh, terms. Uh, we, we can move uh, this uh, negative value to the other side, and eventually it will look like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same, I just I flipped uh, uh, sides of the equation. So on one side, we have the positive value of log of P, and then we have uh, uh, the sum of these two. And I think at this stage, we can kind of try to understand why this is called uh, the evidence lower bound. The, we recall that KL divergence is non-negative, meaning it's always greater or equal to zero. And that means that the log of P is greater or equal to this uh, part, to the expected value part. Um, I guess there's two different ways to view this. The log of P is the upper bound for this term. And this term, which uh, is actually our loss function, is the lower bound for X. And if you recall one of the previous slides, X is referred to as the evidence. So this term is the evidence lower bound. And th th think of this as a constant, and it's equal to the sum of these two. The larger this is, the more it's equal to the log probability of x. And the smaller the divergence is between the two different distribution that we are trying to uh, um, make uh, a similar one to another. So the more this equals zero, uh, the larger this is. And that is why we want to maximize this uh, uh, value. So we refer to this as, again, the evidence lower bound. And we can try to break this uh, part into two different components, which would eventually be the two different loss uh, components of our loss function. So what we can do is first split this log into a sum of two different logs because there's a multiplication between the two. Now, if we group these two together, uh, we, we would have a division between the first and the second. I know there's a minus over here, but if you put the minus before these two, then it would be, again, this uh, divided by this log of both. 
And that is the definition of the KL divergence. So this would be the second term. And uh, uh, the first term, which is what we have left, is the reconstruction term that we've already discussed earlier. So this is the overall uh, objective. This is our loss function. And before I explain how the reparameterization trick uh, comes into play, if you found this video useful in any way, please like and subscribe. It helps me very much, and I would really appreciate it. Um, but the, again, the last thing is how the reparameterization trick comes into play, and it comes into play in the second component, where again we know the we we know uh, we have assumptions on the uh, distribution of z. We know that the mean is zero and that the standard deviation is one. So what we need to do is to approximate whatever z we get such that through the reparameterization trick, we enforce the mu, uh, the mean and the standard deviation to be similar to this one. And again, this is another loss component that can be written as part of the uh, training uh, the model. Thank you very much for uh, seeing this video. And let me know in the comments below if you would like me to make a video on anything else.